A little over three years ago, I had a problem. It wasn't that I was 22 years into a life sentence at San Quentin for a murder I committed when I was 15. My problem is that I had just been found suitable for parole. A moment that should have been filled with joy and happiness was quickly replaced with terror as I realized I'd soon have to start living life on the streets as an adult for the first time. I'd have to get a job with a criminal record and I'd have to start paying taxes like everyone else. Many have already heard that one in three Americans have a criminal history. Now those odds, coupled with my own lack of work history, and my inexperience living in life as an adult, and the severity of my crime, you can understand why I was so scared. Early in my job search, I quickly realized that many entry-level positions even required three years of experience. How is that even possible? Three years of experience for an entry-level position. I didn't have anywhere near three years of experience. What I did have was 22 years of experience as a student, a supervisor, an educator, and a counselor while incarcerated. And I was confident that those skills would translate into the skills that any employer would value. My problem was that I couldn't talk about them unless I talked about my incarceration. To do otherwise would negate anything that I had ever done in my life up to that point that was positive. Now, what kind of TED Talk would this be without mentioning Dr. Brene Brown? This quote captures exactly why we should be transparent. Empathy fuels connection, sympathy drives disconnection. My friend Vincent calls my strategy of transparency radical transparency, as if it's some sort of guerrilla tactic meant to disarm the interviewer, and he's right. Throughout my incarceration and recovery, I learned that when at the mercy of ourselves or others, Transparency and vulnerability can build a bridge to empathy. We're not trying to build sympathy for our past mistakes. We want to build empathy, a true human connection. By being transparent and empathetic, we show others what we're capable of and our true selves. Transparency allows us to take responsibility for our past mistakes and to pivot to showcase our strengths and talents and skills through our lived experiences and build trust and self-confidence. When do you practice transparency? There are four main places during the job search where you can do it. All have their own benefits and disadvantages. The cover letter, the resume, the interview, and when getting a conditional offer. Your cover letter is gonna be your first opportunity to be transparent and showcase your growth. You run the risk of being screened out at this point, but many people are screened out at this point anyway, and they don't even have a criminal record. It's also an opportunity to stand out. This is the actual cover letter I sent out as part of my job search. I worked on it with several different friends and mentors until I felt it captured not only who I was, but what I was capable of. I kept forgetting that my experiences while incarcerated were still experience. It's a matter of framing it in a way that yourself and the employer can understand. I'm excited to be applying for an entry-level software engineering opportunity with you. I believe my personality, work ethic, unique experience, and skill set are perfect fit for the position. As a child sentenced to adult prison at 15, I thought my life was over. Instead, it was the start of a liberating journey of empowerment in which I was chosen valedictorian of my college class, completion of the highly selective last mile coding program, and successfully entered the web development industry. My unique and arduous journey of transformation embedded me with a deep sense of determination, tenacity, and fortitude necessary to overcome any challenges I will face as I begin this next chapter as a software engineer. As an alumni of The Last Mile, a comprehensive computer science and web development immersive program training incarcerated people to become web developers, I quickly learned that learning to code in prison was severely challenging. No internet access, limited time on computers, all within the uncertainty and chaos of prison itself. However, my environmental restraints forced me to become hyper-focused, flexible, and creative at solving problems. While an employee of The Last Mile, I've successfully worked both as part of a team with designers and engineers, as well as independently crafting websites using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Node, and WordPress. Although I have the ability to lead when necessary, I find a supportive work environment with a team-first mentality best suits me as a person with strong social skills, a positive attitude, and the ability to think on my feet. I believe everyone has something to teach someone else, tech-related or otherwise and having the opportunity to learn from someone with different experiences is invaluable. 
If I was fortunate enough to be chosen for a position by Checker, I would bring the same grit, tenacity, and unique perspective I developed during my journey to your team. I look forward to meeting your amazing team of engineers, developing cutting edge world-class technologies, helping to build a great product that serves so many people. Face it, everyone likes a car accident and the look. And my life up to that point was a 30 car pileup in a two lane highway in icy conditions. And I counted on that to get me in the room. I wasn't wrong, every employer I submitted that resume to and that cover letter to gave me a call back. They all reached out and they were curious and excited to meet me, even if some of them told me at the very beginning of the interview, they weren't even gonna consider me for a job because of my record, but they still wanted to meet me. Now, when it comes to your resume, it may not even be looked at. It might have years missing, uh, which could hint to a potential employer about you being in prison. And it's hard to be transparent and impactful in a resume anyway. Now, what happens when you get your foot in the door? Do you talk about it in the beginning, the middle, the end of the interview? Do you wait for an offer even? Having gone through my parole hearing, the most important interview of my life, less than a year before my job search began, I realized that the strategies I used to prepare for that hearing translated well to the job search. Being up from, from the beginning allowed me to control the dialogue, take ownership of my past, and pivot the conversation to my growth and what value I could add to the team. Waiting until the middle of the interview I felt was risky. It can make it awkward. And with only half an interview left, it'd be hard to recover. Waiting until the end of the interview I felt was riskiest of all. It's like telling your fiance on your wedding day about not having children, only instead it's, oh wait, I was in prison. It allows them to take control of your dialogue and your narrative and start to tell the story and fill in the blanks in their mind. Offer to submit evidence of rehabilitation. Evidence of rehabilitation is things you did during or after your incarceration to improve yourself professionally and personally. I took a three ring binder of every class and I took while incarcerated, like anger management, substance abuse classes, letters of support and recommendation. The same packet I submitted to my parole board is the same packet I submitted to my employers. Evidence of rehabilitation provides two things. One is evidence of what you've accomplished. It could be a wow moment to the interviewer. Two, it's evidence they can take back to their employer or to their hiring committee and possibly advocate for you. Now at the end of the interview, I hope that you felt like you did yourself justice and showed the best version of yourself. And if you didn't, don't worry about it. Plenty of people go through interviews every day and don't get the job. Take what you learned from this interview and hone your narrative. Do all the normal things. Send a follow-up email, a thank you note. If you haven't already, send that evidence of rehabilitation. Now it's also important to understand what could, hap what could show up on your background check. Remember, this is the last thing employers see. And if you haven't shown them a different version of yourself, this allows them to actually start to take control of your narrative again and fill in the blanks, which could lead to a quick no. This is how mine showed up. No context, just a static charge. A static moment of my life that'll never change. Is that really what you wanna leave them with? Now employers, you have responsibilities too. If one third of people have a criminal history, that means one third of your potential workforce has a criminal history. I challenge you to embrace diversity, not just in name, but in practice. Consider the nature time nature test when considering fair chance talent. Because that's what we are, we're talent, just like everyone else. Consider the nature of the crime, the time since it happened, and the nature of the job or the work to be done. Then ask yourself, does it even matter? More than likely it doesn't. Second, Lower the barrier and not the bar. Consider a person for who they are and what they're capable of, not necessarily what they've done. You can look at people with a record as if they're people changing careers. They may not have experience in the role, but they do have experience. They're just trying to lead a new and better life. Five months after I walked out of San Quentin, I started my internship at Checker as a software engineer. Three years later, I'm still here. Last year, I celebrated another milestone in my life. I got my first promotion in my life. Now, none of this would have even been possible, not just if Checker didn't give me a chance, but if the people around me, my coworkers, didn't believe in me and give me the chance to work with them. All I ask is that you give others a chance like they gave me. Thank you.